So now that we understand how a uniformly continuous function has this property that the delta that we pick for a given epsilon to make the y values of my function epsilon close to f of x when the x values are delta close to x, that uniformly continuous functions let us choose that delta before we know which x value, so that there's one delta that works across the entire domain of uniform continuity, that feels like a really technical condition and a really difficult thing to be able to check. If we really need a function to be uniformly continuous for some reason, isn't there an easier way than trying to go back to the definition and wrestle with this triply quantified definition? And fortunately for us, the answer is yes. And in the next couple of videos, we're going to see what I call three guarantees of uniform continuity. Three things which are easier to check than the definition of uniformly continuous that can guarantee that a function is uniformly continuous. The first one we'll see in this video has to do with a question of slope. So what does slope have to do with whether or not a function is uniformly continuous? Let's take a look. So first of all, I think we're already convinced that slope has a role to play in how the epsilon that you pick for me relates to the delta that I pick in response to your epsilon. For example, if I have a function like the one I've graphed here, uh, where the slope is really, really sort of shallow at some points, then where the slope is shallow, I have a lot more wiggle room to choose a larger value of delta to fit a given value of epsilon. But that same delta that I pick, if I try to go to a different place in the domain of my function where maybe the slope is getting steeper, that same delta no longer works anymore. Right? And so somehow, how steep the graph of my function is from place to place is going to have an impact on how well whatever delta that I select is going to work for the epsilon that you choose, regardless of which value of x that I happen to be using. And so clearly, there is some sort of a role that can be played by slope. And so the question for us is, how do we discover that role? How do we figure out how the slopes of points, which remember, we're talking about continuous functions, not differentiable functions, at least not yet. So we don't have a derivative that can help us to understand what a slope of a graph or a tangent line might be. Instead, we just have continuous functions. So whatever notion of slope that we come up with had better be something that exists for functions that are just continuous and doesn't require them to have a derivative or something fancier that we might have learned about in our calculus class. So let's figure out how to get slope to the table in this conversation. To do that, let's just take another look at the definition of uniform continuity. f is uniformly continuous on a domain E if, for all epsilon that you pick, I can find a delta such that for any two points in my domain, as long as those two points are delta close to one another, then their images are going to be epsilon close to one another. And it's this for all points in the domain piece that is what makes uniform continuity so special, that we're picking the delta before we pick the arbitrary points in the domain. But when I look at this definition a little bit more closely, I see a couple of things. I see a, a difference in x values, right? I see something that looks like a run on an xy coordinate graph. And I also see a difference in f of x values. These are y values. And so that difference is something like a rise on an xy coordinate graph of my function. And so if I can get those two quantities together somehow, maybe say divide one of them by the other, then I should get something that kind of resembles a slope. So here's an idea. An idea by looking at these two things would be to say that if I want to make my f of x values epsilon close to one another, and I want to use the slope of the graph to help me do that, what I can do with this difference between f of x and f of x naught is I can multiply and divide it by the difference between x and x naught. I've got absolute values around everything here just because we have absolute values in this definition. So when I speak of slope here, I'm really kind of speaking about steepness. It's the absolute value of a slope. Um, but if I multiply and divide by this absolute value of x minus x naught, then this quantity that I'm trying to get to be smaller than epsilon can be viewed as a product of this quotient, this ratio, which really is the absolute value of a rise divided by the absolute value of a run. It's the absolute value of a slope. Namely, the slope of a secant line drawn between the points x comma f of x and x naught comma f of x naught on the graph of f multiplied by the absolute value of x minus x naught. This is the run, again, if you like, you know, the absolute distance between the two x values that we've selected. And then by looking at these two factors, we realize that 
In order to satisfy the definition of uniform continuity, this distance between x and x0 is something that we get to have some control over because we're the ones picking the delta in response to the epsilon that the universe picks for us. And that delta is the upper bound on the distance between x and x0. So we get to control this factor, the distance between x minus x0, just in how we pick our delta. And so the one piece of this product here that we don't necessarily have control over is this first factor, this slope of the secant line on the graph. So if for some reason we can control that slope, then we will be able to control this entire quantity and we can make it be less than epsilon the way that we want it to be. So what this tells me is that as long as these slopes remain bounded, as long as these slopes don't get too big, as long as they don't blow up to infinity for some choices of x and x0 inside of my domain, as long as these slopes remain bounded, I can use whatever the bound is on that slope, let's call it capital M, I can use that bound to choose the right delta in response to your epsilon. We can pick, for example, delta to be epsilon divided by m. So if I have a function that has that boundedness property on its secant slopes, then my claim is that that function will get to automatically be uniformly continuous on my domain. So the criterion here is that we need for there to exist a capital M such that no matter which two points in my domain that I choose, the slope of the secant line to the graph of my function between those two points is never any larger than this capital M. So if the slopes of all my secant lines remain bounded by some upper bound, then the claim is that that is going to guarantee my function is uniformly continuous. So we're saying no secant line drawn on the graph of my function will have a slope that's steeper than plus or minus capital M. Functions that have this property are called Lipschitz functions. Um, and Lipschitz functions are those that have a bound on the slopes of their secant lines that that bound is good across the entire domain of our function. So first of all, what should Lipschitz functions look like? So how could we recognize them? Like what's actually going on on the graph of a function that lets us determine that this is in fact a Lipschitz function? So this number, this upper bound, this capital M, is sometimes called the Lipschitz constant or the Lipschitz bound for my function. So let's suppose I have the function that's graphed underneath me here, and I'd like to assess whether or not one, the number one, could be a Lipschitz bound for this function on the domain, which is the interval from zero to one. So in order to test that, what I'm really asking is, are there any secant lines that we can draw between two points on this graph? whose slope is greater than one or is less than negative one. If so, then one is not a good Lipschitz bound for this function. Graphically, what does this look like? Well, what this looks like is if we take a sort of a bow tie that looks like this, where this bow tie is bounded by lines that have a slope of plus or minus one. So the slope of these lines on this graph here is plus and minus one. If I can contain the entire graph of my function within these bow ties as we go from one point in the domain across to every other point in this domain, then this function will be Lipschitz with a Lipschitz constant of one. But it doesn't look like I can quite do that, not for the slope of one. So one is not a Lipschitz bound for this function because there are some points, for example, this one right here, where the graph escapes this bow tie that's defined by the slopes of plus and minus one. So shading in the region between the slopes of plus and minus one. Um, so maybe I just need a larger Lipschitz bound. Maybe one is not a, a large enough value for my upper bound. Maybe I could choose, I don't know, five. So are there any secant lines on this graph that have a slope greater than five or less than minus five? So now my bow tie is a little bit wider. And this time if I slide my bow tie across the graph of my function, there's no point. Oh, wait. Yes, there is one point right there where the graph escapes my bow tie just a little bit. So there are some secant lines that have a slope of greater than five or less than minus five, in particular between this green point that I've marked here and between one of the points which lies outside the bow tie over here. So then maybe I need to make an even wider bow tie, a slope of 10 or something like that, and keep trying. And I think we would have to do a little bit of zooming in on this just to be sure. But I think that even for 10, it looks like we do escape the bow tie at some point over here. So this particular function, at least based on my graphical heuristic for what a Lipschitz function looks like, is probably not a Lipschitz function. It turns out that we can show that this function is uniformly continuous, um, but this one doesn't happen to be Lipschitz. 
So you're going to have to take my word on that one for now. Um, in a different video, we'll put a formula to this function and show that indeed it is uniformly continuous, but in fact it's not a Lipschitz function. Um, but for the purposes of the current video, what we want to do is show that if we do have a function that's Lipschitz, that we can contain its graph entirely within the bow ties across all the points in my domain, then that will be a guarantee of uniform continuity. So just as an example of what a Lipschitz function does look like, here's an example of a function where if I pick a slopes of plus and minus 10, is what I'm using for my bow tie in this example, then the entire graph of this function is always contained within that bow tie, no matter where the center of that bow tie is, where the slopes are plus and minus 10 that define my bow tie. So no secant line on the graph of this function has a slope that's any steeper than plus or minus 10. So let's write out a proof, and all of the ingredients are already sort of waiting for us uh, on the screen here, uh, for the fact that every Lipschitz function is automatically uniformly continuous. So to make the argument, we just have to put all of the ingredients that are sort of underneath us here uh, into place. So starting from the definition of uniform continuity, let's let epsilon be chosen arbitrarily, greater than zero. We would like to show that there exists a delta such that being delta close to x naught means that we are epsilon close to f of x naught, always uniformly across the entire domain. And our insight was this one right here, that we can make this, this control happen. We can control the distance between f of x and f of x naught to be less than epsilon by choosing our delta to be epsilon divided by this Lipschitz bound, epsilon divided by m. And so we will exercise our prerogative as the authors of this proof to set delta equals epsilon over capital M, where capital M is the Lipschitz bound for the Lipschitz function f, which exists by definition of Lipschitz. So next ingredient in the definition of uniform continuity is to choose an x and an x naught arbitrarily from my domain. And we choose them in a way such that they are delta close to one another. So x minus x naught, an absolute value, is less than delta. Now we need to show that the absolute value of f of x minus f of x naught is less than epsilon, that the images of these points are epsilon close. So how do we do that? Well, we'll again use this idea right, that the y distance, the distance between the images of these two points, is equal to the secant slope multiplied by the horizontal distance. It's the secant slope multiplied by the run, basically. right? Slope times run gives us rise. And now we'll use our ability to control each of these two factors. Well, first of all, since I'm multiplying and dividing by something, I should probably make sure that this thing that I'm dividing by is not equal to 0. If that thing is equal to 0, then we're stuck. We can't multiply and divide by it and not change the value of the function. In fact, we're going to get a, a quantity that's undefined. So we should probably dispatch with that case. If somehow we randomly manage to draw a hand from the universe in which x is equal to x naught, well, then there's really nothing for us to prove, because then the distance between their images is equal to 0, which, of course, is less than epsilon, because epsilon is always chosen to be a positive number. So if x is equal to x0, we're already done. We don't have to make this argument. So it's OK for us to multiply and divide by the absolute value of x minus x0, because we know that we can divide by it whenever it's non-zero. When it's equal to 0, our argument is already true. And so we'll assume it's not equal to 0, and therefore we can multiply and divide by it. Then. This absolute value of my secant slope is by definition of Lipschitz and by assumption that f is a Lipschitz function less than or equal to capital M. And by assumption, the distance between x and x naught is less than delta. Just by our, uh, again, by our hypothesis of uniform continuity, uh, we're going to say assume x minus x naught is less than delta, an absolute value. And so this product is less than m times delta. But by construction, we have chosen delta to be epsilon over m. And so the m's cancel, and we are left with the absolute value of f of x minus f of x naught is less than epsilon, completing the proof. So this is the first way in which we can guarantee that a function is not only continuous, but in fact uniformly continuous. One of the cool things about Lipschitz functions is that they give us uniform continuity. And so in particular, they give us continuity. It is not possible to have a Lipschitz function that is not continuous. In fact, every Lipschitz function is uniformly continuous. We didn't even have to make a delicate epsilon delta argument to sort of show separately that f was a continuous function along the way. We can go all the way from being Lipschitz, which is just a condition on the slopes of secant lines. That condition goes all the way for us to uniform continuity.
Now, not every uniformly continuous function is Lipschitz. But because Lipschitz is a condition that can be relatively easy to check, depending on the situation, um, that condition alone can guarantee uniform continuity. A little bit later on, when we start talking about differentiable functions and slopes of tangent lines and the mean value theorem and all of that fun stuff, we'll be able to relate questions about the derivative of a function, which tell us about tangent slopes, to questions like questions of uniform continuity. But for the meantime, we don't need derivatives. We just need slopes of secant lines. And every function for which the slopes of secant lines remain bounded between plus and minus capital M satisfies this Lipschitz condition with a Lipschitz bound of M will be uniformly continuous. That's the first of our three guarantees. In the next video, we're going to see a guarantee that is even easier to use in a lot of situations, which instead of saying something special about the function, says something special about the domain of the function. Stick around for that one. You won't want to miss it.